this is Will from SRT Amplification and welcome to another installment of Music News Monday. Today I got a few things I want to cover right up front, uh, some small things, and then I want to get to the large item that I want to talk about and discuss today, and that is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I'll leave you in suspense on that. But uh, the first thing I wanted to look at was this article that I ran across from a uh, news agency in Texas, local news. Man stole guitars worth $5,000 and tried to pawn them for hundreds. So basically, in Texas, what happened is this guy decides that he's going, look at this real winner. <laughs> anyway, he's accused of uh, stealing guitars. He stole two guitars. Basically, he walked into a music store in Austin, Texas, uh, saw the first two guitars that he came across right there by the door, and just walked out with them. And they happened to be a uh, Fender American Original Telecaster worth around two grand and a Fender Limited Edition Jazz Master worth around three grand. Uh, he also had an accomplice, accomplice uh, with him. And uh, I guess this guy tried to get two guitars that were up a little higher on some uh, hooks. And he was so short that he, he ended up dropping the guitars. Anyway, they both walk out. Uh, I'll leave a link to this in the in the con in the description. But um, they, you know, he he pawned the Telecaster for six hundred bucks at a pawn store. Three days later, he pawned the Jazzmaster for five hundred dollars. Uh, he he used his real Texas ID when he did this, so it was you know pretty easy to find him. And um, then. You know, when they caught him, he said that his ID had been stolen. So, but I mean, if this guy walked into your pawn shop, could you ever forget this guy? I mean, really. Um, they got him on cameras, everything. Anyway, he's being charged with uh, one count of felony theft, and, and his bond was set for $7,500. So, <laughs> of course, this is in Texas, so he'll probably get the death penalty. But anyway, um, that was a joke, by the way. Uh, another thing I ran across, and I've been finding these these weird things, you know, little novelty items, I guess, for guitar. But I, I ran across this in a in a Facebook group the other day, and it is a uh, I really don't know what it is, but uh, I'll just pull this up here. It says that it is a uh, this. You can buy these for two dollars. It's a guitar trainer for beginner finger expansion, finger extender trainer, something or another. But basically, it's just plastic piece. <laughs> and it shows here, you know, before and after. Anyway, okay. Write down in your comments what you, what you think about this device. <laughs> this almost cracks me up as much as the other one <laughs> that I showed a couple of episodes ago. Anyway, oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Whew. All right. The next thing is uh, over last week, uh, actually the day after I made my last... Uh, Monday uh, uh, music news video uh, that Tuesday uh, they had a really large uh, auction at Bonhams in London and um, I had covered a couple of these things before one of the one of the things that I had covered in a previous episode was this uh, recording console here and it ended up selling for uh, one hundred forty one thousand dollars. Uh, US. This is the recording console or pieces of this recording console supposedly, you know, was what Led Zeppelin 4 album, Stairway to Heaven, all that was recorded on. A bunch of Eric Clapton stuff, Bob Marley, Jimi Hendrix, a whole bunch of stuff from that era was recorded on this. So it went for 140 uh, something thousand dollars. Um, hopefully, you know, a band like uh, Greta Van Fleet or something like that got this thing, so maybe they can get a little more Led Zeppelin mojo or something. I don't know, but uh, 
thought that was pretty interesting. So that's a kind of a follow up on that. And then if you remember, um, last uh, Music News Monday, I had this up there and, and told you the story of how this guitar was stolen and they got it back and it has all these signatures on it. It's signed by Eric Clapton, Brian May, uh, Pete Townsend, Gary Moore, Martin Offler, Albert Lee, a whole bunch of people signed this thing. And this guy really went around and, and, and found all these artists and got them to sign this. But I guess he had, uh, had to mail it to Martin Offler and in the process it got stolen. And anyway, it finally went to auction. It's for charity. Um, move this. The charity was for, um, the uh, Rainbow Children Hospice. So this thing sold for about 11 grand US, uh, which is good. I'm glad that, that they made that much money for the for the charity and everything. But, you know, with all the people who signed this, I can understand how it didn't go for, for more, especially when you see in the same auction, you had this guitar, which belonged to uh, KK Downing of Judas Priest, and it went for a whopping $188,000. You know, no signature or anything on it. It's just his guitar. Um, I don't get it. Um, it. You know, almost 20 times more than the, the charity guitar with all those signatures on it. And granted, this charity guitar is a, you know, it's a made in Mexico Stratocaster, probably seven or eight hundred dollars new, uh, is the value of this guitar, and uh, but the signatures on it, there's so many signatures on it. I mean, Pete Townsend, Brian May, Jimmy Page, um, Gary Moore, Martin Opler, I mean, Alice Cooper, Steven Seagal even signed this thing, so. I don't know. It makes you wonder. And plus, it was for charity. You would, you would expect it to go for a lot more. But uh, kudos to the guy who uh, got this thing. Um, I'm, uh, yeah. That's fine there. Now, let's go to the uh, thing that I've been burning about. Uh, as you guys know, the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has uh, given its... Uh, Put out the uh, class of night of 2019. I think the uh, ceremony will be sometime in March. But the reason I bring it up now is because uh, finally the you know my favorite band, my favorite rock band, uh, or one of my favorite rock bands, I guess probably my most favorite rock band, Def Leppard, uh, finally made it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They've been eligible now for almost 20 years, and. Um, yeah, they made it. So kudos to them. Um, I'm, I'm glad they made it. But uh, I've got a bone to pick with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I have for a long time. And I've really not uh, been a big fan of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, about 10 years ago, I wrote an email to the president, or I just wrote it to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but the, the president of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame actually... Um, wrote me a letter uh, through email, and I'll, I'll read that to you. I couldn't find the original, um, I couldn't find the original email that I actually sent to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but basically what it was was how in the world does the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame work? You know, why are there not bands in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that should be and that kind of thing. Granted, this was 10 years ago. So in that in that time period, things have changed. You know, we have online voting, fan voting and stuff now. And um, that has kind of changed a little bit. But still, the, the nominee process is kind of behind closed doors. And it's kind of by the people in the music biz and not really the fans of the music. But um, the basically, the gist of this email was, and I'll just kind of read it to you. It says... Um, Thanks for your email. Here's how the process works. Um, 
nomination and induction to the Hall of Fame is not a popular is not about popularity, record sales, which label the group is on, or anything other than the process below. The love for, the evaluation of, and the impact of any artist are subjective questions to be answered by the nominators and the voters. Unlike baseball, football, basketball, or hockey, statistics aren't relevant. Well, let's just stop right there. I don't understand why statistics aren't relevant in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I mean, in order to be in the Baseball Hall of Fame, you have to A, play baseball, B, coach baseball, C, have some ties to baseball, whether you're a baseball announcer or something like that. You know, Harry Carey uh, is in the Baseball Hall of Fame as an announcer, things like that. But it's something to do with baseball. So, and why are statistics relevant? Uh, you don't get into the Baseball Hall of Fame simply by playing baseball. You have to have some, you know, stats. I'm a Atlanta Braves fan when it comes to baseball. I know I got my Dallas Cowboys hat on today. So I'm filming this on Sunday and they're about to play in an hour. Uh, so hopefully they beat the Colts. But, you know, just because I'm a fan of a certain sports team doesn't mean that I believe everybody that ever played for that team should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That, I mean, that makes it subjective. That's a subjective way of putting people in. You have to have an objective way of putting people in. And evidently, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame process is not that. So let's move on. It says the entire nomination and induction process is coordinated by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Foundation in New York City. So the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Foundation is not even in the town where the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is, which is Cleveland, Ohio. All right, so they're detached already from you know, mid America. They're, they're up in court in uh, corporate land up there somewhere in New York city. Artists can be inducted in four categories, performer, early influence, non-performer and side men. The latter three categories are evaluated and decided by separate committees. So we're just talking about performers here basically is what I'm kind of PO'd about. Uh, the selection of performers is a two-step process. The only formal criteria for the performance category is that the artist has to have had their first record 25 years ago. So the only formal criteria to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is that you had to have a record 25 years ago. So you don't even have to be rock and roll to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It says it right there. That said, candidates are reviewed and discussed relative to their impact on this music that we broadly call rock and roll. The innovation and influence of these artists is also critical. Gold records, number one hits, and million sellers are really not appropriate standards for evaluation. Well, no. You shouldn't use actual hard numbers to evaluate something. I mean, if a fan loves a band so much that they buy their albums, and those numbers of albums are up in the millions and millions and millions, to me, that says something of that band. Um, wow. Wow. The formal selection of performers begins with an extensive panel of journalists, whoo, historians, previous inductees, noted musicians, industry heads, etc. In turn, those nominated are set to a committee of more than 500 people around the world, journalists, historians, yada, 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 who vote. Those receiving the highest number of votes and more than 50% of the votes cast are inducted into the hall. Usually this means five to seven new performing members each year. All this said, you can see the road to being inducted as an arduous one and the most, and for the most part removed uh, from the realm of influences or politics. Yeah, right. I know for sure there are certain people that will never be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame just because of their political views. Ah. Uh. Finally, as I noted above, everyone personalizes everything about rock and roll when they are brought into the circle of discussion. As such, the definition of rock and roll, who is or was important, and who should be inducted is incredibly subjective. Well, no kidding, because you've made it that way. Everyone believes themselves to be an expert. Unfortunately, there are no longer any absolutes when it comes to candidates. The Chuck Berry, Elvis Little Richard, Beatles days are gone. Going forward, the controversy will continue. Having said that, I believe that all worthy candidates will be inducted, just not always when they or their fans deem timely. In fact, there's not only precedent, 
There's not only precedent in our history, but also with the Sports Halls of Fame, where many great players, great stars, do not get inducted in their first year of eligibility. Well, let me tell you who did get inducted their first year of eligibility. Madonna. And you tell me, Madonna. Madonna. I don't even consider her music rock and roll, number one. But Madonna made it in her first time. You know, anyway. I replied back to this and I said, thank you for your response. I value what you had to say. Granted, this is 2008, you can see up here. 2008, this is 10 years ago. Okay, since then, some of these bands that I mentioned here have, have got in. I think uh, partially because a lot of people, a lot of the fans got upset and they started pushing back. And a lot of the people in music, like uh, people like Eddie Trunk and stuff like that, uh, had done a lot to push uh, in this direction. But it says, I value, I said, I value what you had to say about the process of selecting members into the Hall of Fame. I just can't believe that. It has little to do with popularity or album sales. I mean, what did Madonna do that Janis Joplin, Dusty Springfield, and Joni Mitchell didn't? Um, so I think Janis Joplin took her like three or four years uh, to make it in after her eligibility. Dusty Springfield, same thing. Joni Mitchell, I think, was like eight years before she made it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What makes her even one to be considered? She barely meets the time criteria, and she's getting in. Took Janice three years for, okay, I already, yeah. Uh, these women were the pioneers of women in rock and roll. As far as groups go, ACDC, Van Halen, The Police, and U2, I can totally agree with. But where are their influences? Where is Thin Lizzy, which still hasn't got in? Kiss, which at the time wasn't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, is now. Rush is now, finally. And most of all, Boston, still not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. These bands shaped a decade of music in the 70s and ushered in a whole new era of music throughout the 90s, or throughout the 80s. But instead, we get to rock and roll all night and party every day with Leonard Cohen and Madonna. That's great. So anyway, that's kind of my frustrations. One of those, this is what really grinds my gears, kind of, uh, kind of segments, I guess. But... Uh, if you have anything to uh, add about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or you find it um, in any way uh, the same way that I do, I, I, I will say this. It is getting better. A lot of the bands that 10 years ago uh, were not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame are now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I can think of a, a many, you know, Deep Purple. Uh, there's a whole bunch that has made it since then. Uh, but uh, it's just it's just ridiculous in my opinion. But let me know what you think in the comments. For my pick of the week, this week is uh, Chicago Transit Authority. It's an album released in 1968 by Chicago, which at the time they were going by Chicago Transit Authority. They had to end up changing their name because of the Chicago Transit Authority entity there in Chicago. But uh, this album was, like I said, put out in 1968. I'm a big fan of jazz rock fusion and this is kind of a uh, one of the early recordings of jazz rock fusion you know, back back then you had uh, people like Santana uh, Chicago uh, later you had bands like Steely Dan and the like but anyway this um, this band had Peter Cetera on bass and vocals um, Robert Lamb on keyboards and vocals pretty much they all sang at one point or another Terry Kath on guitar right here you see very 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 underrated guitarist he didn't live very long he died in the mid 70s uh, but he was a phenomenal guitarist very 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 good but uh, if you ever run across this album pick it up because uh, you can find it in most used record stores, vinyl stores, uh, thrift stores, um, garage sales. <laughs> but it's got a it's got a bunch of good songs on it. It's got a. Um, does anybody really know what time it is? Which everybody knows that song. Beginnings, question sixty seven and sixty eight. Uh, Freeform guitar, which is an excellent solo by Terry Kath. Uh, I'm a man. Uh, Liberation, very, very good album. So, um, try to.
try to pick that up and give it a listen if you can't find it on vinyl and you've never heard it uh, just find it on Spotify and take a listen to it all right well that'll wrap it up for music news Monday this week if you haven't already hit subscribe down there in the bottom and like this video and until next week thank you very much uh -huh.